I welcome you to the 2020 Summer Franciscan Zoom Lecture Series hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Father Tom Nairn is the Franciscan and Provincial Minister at the Sacred Heart Franciscan Province, headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri. Before becoming Provincial, he was the Senior Director of Theology and Ethics at the Catholic Health Association of the United States. In that position, he worked as Catholic with Catholic hospitals and healthcare systems throughout the country. He has written two books on consistent ethic of life. He is here today to present Pope Francis, Integral Ecology and the Consistent Ethic of Life, Calls for a Wider Moral Vision. I welcome Father Nairn. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, one other element that I probably should have mentioned to Michelle earlier, my great claim to fame is I'm a member of the Board of Regents of uh, Franciscan School of Theology. Well, many of you who have been very close to the school have probably never met me. I am one of the people behind the scenes. Uh, as Michelle said, I've been working uh, as a Catholic healthcare ethicist for most of my career that spans about almost 45 years. Uh, I was a healthcare ethicist. I also began teaching at your competitor school, the Catholic Theological Union at Chicago. And it was there that I became, uh, came in contact with Cardinal Joseph Bernadine. Uh, and it was the Cardinal Bernadine who began the notion of a consistent ethic of life. Actually, Cardinal Baderos, 15 years before, used the term, but it was Cardinal Bernadine that popularized it. In uh, 1983, he was asked to give a talk at Fordham University about the peace pastoral. And he tried to suggest that the peace pastoral is part of a larger what he called consistent ethic of life. Uh, that probably would have been a one-time only talk, except the next morning it was on the front page of the New York Times. And suddenly you had groups questioning exactly what Cardinal Bernini was talking about. Uh, you had justice groups saying, how does this fit in really with justice? You had pro-life groups saying, you can't have justice in pro-life. And there was this huge argument that began. And in trying to deal with both sides, Cardinal Bernadine basically gave 35 lectures for the next 13 years on the consistent ethic of life. He died in 1996. And when Pope Francis became Pope in 2013, many people began seeing echoes of the consistent ethic in what Pope Francis was saying. Uh, I don't want to say there's any dependence. I don't think an Argentinian ever read uh, Cardinal Bernadine, but they're very close. So as we take a look at what this might mean, we see that with Cardinal Joseph Bernadine, his real concern was that too often issues of life and justice are treated as separate and self-contained. We have basically siloed morality. We have our personal morality in one silo. We have our social morality in another. And sadly, oftentimes in many writings, never the twain meet. What Cardinal wanted to suggest is that that approach fails to show how decisions in one area affect the decisions in the other. And what he tried to do is bring them close together. His sort of mantra was, life is both sacred and social. As we respect the sacredness of life, we side with the pro-life group. But as we acknowledge the social dimension of life, we have to acknowledge the important social tradition of the Catholic Church he wants to say these are not two different aspects uh, that, that don't talk to each other, but these are aspects that in fact have to talk to each other. 
He said, life issues are justice issues. Justice issues are life issues. Now, interestingly, during his lifetime, he received criticism from both sides. And just as people weren't quite sure about his commitment to justice, pro-life people were not sure about his commitment to life. I think they're both wrong. I tend to think this is the way it needs to be done. And this is the way Pope Francis has also been working. And as we celebrate this year, the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, I think we begin seeing in Pope Francis the theological articulation of what Cardinal Bernadine was trying to do. And so early on in his papacy, the first year that he was Pope, in uh, 2013, he wrote what is called an apostolic exhortation called Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. And that document was an extensive reflection on Pope Paul VI document on the development of peoples. And there's a term that Pope Paul VI kept using and that was integral human development. In Laudato Si, his great encyclical on the environment, he changes the language from integral human development to integral ecology, bringing the environment and human life issues together. And interestingly, in a way very close to what Cardinal Bernadine had said, he says, that what we need is a vision capable of taking into consideration every aspect of the global crisis that's facing the world. And again, exactly as Bernadine said, he says everything is closely related. But what does that look like? Now, Cardinal Bernadine saw his consistent ethic as what he called a call for a wider moral vision. And I want to suggest that that's exactly what Car uh, Pope Francis is doing as well. Now we can have a discussion of the content of both uh, projects, which would be interesting, but it's not what I'm going to do. What I'd like to do is dig a little deeper and talk about what I see the commitments that both church men are doing. What are their commitments in this conversation? And so what I would like to suggest is uh -huh. a little too fast on the trigger, is that the first, uh, oh, there's no dependence. There are similar value commitments on both men. And that more so even than Cardinal Bernadine, what Pope Francis does is give an explicit biblical, theological, and spiritual basis for the commitments. And the three commitments are simple respect for the other, the acknowledgement that contemporary issues, especially contemporary moral issues are complex and we cannot oversimplify that complexity and to acknowledge that the church develops in its response to these issues and that that development both believe is guided by the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at each and every one of those commitments. So easily, uh, respect for the other. Now, obviously, if we're dealing with respect for life, respect is there. But what I'd like to suggest is that uh, respect for Cardinal Bernadine is a very important issue. He basically said in almost one of the very first lectures he gave that we have to acknowledge that there are divisions within society, uh, but we need in those divisions not to create further divisions. He says we need to act with honest and respectful, in an honest and respectful manner that can seek and find common ground where all can work for the common good. It's interesting, there are three parts to Cardinal Bernadine's life. His first was working on the peace pastoral that many of older folks would know, came out in 1983. 
from 1983 into 1996, very strong in the consistent ethic of life. And in 1996, he began what was called the Common Ground Initiative, trying to bring liberals and conservatives in the church together to talk to one another, something I think is needed very much now. Cardinal Bernadine, acknowledging respect, basically said that we in the U.S. live in a religiously pluralistic society. Even though we don't agree with others in our society, even though we might have very different opinions, we still need to respect the conscience of those with whom we disagree. Towards the end of the Cardinal's life, he said, that's the quote on your screen, vigorous pursuit of our deepest convictions should not involve questioning the motives of others or their character. We can oppose conclusions that we find unwise or immoral. We should vigorously pursue essential human life and dignity, but we should also be known for the way in which we witness. That witness needs to leaven public life in a spirit of fairness, respect, restraint, and search for the common good. Respect becomes one of the hallmarks, one of the value commitments of the consistent ethic of life. Similarly with Pope Francis, in his very first apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, he basically says that respect is the holy ground of the other. And theologically, he stated that respect heals wounds, builds bridges, and helps us bear one another's burdens. As you see in the quote on the screen, it is only through respectful and compassionate listening that we can enter into the path of true growth and awaken a yearning for the Christian ideal the desire to respond fully to God's love. God's love, God's mercies, God's mercy is very strongly understood by the Pope. And he's constantly trying to bring that to others. And in his Jesuit way, he also chides those who don't follow that way. He says people look to compensate their own discontent by lashing out at others. And claiming to uphold the other commandments they completely ignore the eighth, which for, forbids ruthlessly vilifying others. The same commitments respect the sacred ground of the other. So respect becomes one. How do we enter any dialogue for either church man? It's by means of respect. Part of that respect is to acknowledge the, cons the uh, complexity of modern life today. Um, Cardinal Bernadine again said that there are few moral issues that are neatly black and white. That if we're really true to our faith, we are gonna deal with an awful lot of gray issues. And the Cardinal kept saying, what the task of the church is, is to clarify our moral cho choices not simplify them in an inappropriate way. We are to be clear with our beliefs, but never condescending to the other, never simplistic. And again, at the very beginning of his discussion, within a year of his beginning, the Consistent Ethic of Life lectures at the Woodstock Forum. Now Woodstock, for us who are old, has nothing to do with New York. The Woodstock Forum, is a Jesuit forum on social justice in, from Georgetown University. Uh, he said that the issue of complexity is one that we all must face. Moral judgments of public life, and Cardinal was basically concerned with the Catholic Church's public social stance. The dimensions of our public life are always interwoven with empirical judgments where honest disagreement exists. But again, as he said with respect, that shouldn't paralyze us. 
We should be clear with what we believe, but always listening to the other. And again, Pope Francis goes a bit deeper. In his understanding of complexity, uh, he goes one step beyond, I believe, Pope uh, uh, Cardinal Bernadine. While Carl, Cardinal Bernadine ex discusses empirical complexity, Pope Francis calls upon the church to understand the complexity of moral issues and the real limits people have in trying to deal with the moral issues that face us today. Basically, the Cardinal says, or the, sorry, the Pope says time and time again that we can never be rigid. Rigidity, he says, is not suited to the complex reality that living life today demands, as well as to the witness of the gospel. As we see in, in this quote from his first epistolic exhortation, the complete sense of human life that the gospel proposes is the best remedy for ills, even though it can never be a uniform and re, re, sorry, rigid program that is not suited to the complexities of modern life. But to live our life to the fullness and to meet every challenge as the level of the gospel witness in every culture will make us better Christians and bear fruit. Which also means that how the church in Africa deals with its issues might not be the same as the church in the United States, may not be the same as the church in Europe, may not be the same as the church in Latin America or Asia. We need to understand the reality we are in and let the gospel speak to that reality. How do we do it? The Pope is a great Jesuit. His answer to how we look at this is what he calls missionary discernment. Now discernment has become a huge tool in Jesuit spirituality. Discernment is an important tool in Franciscan spirituality. Um, how the Pope describes missionary discernment is to allow the truth and goodness and light of the gospel to affect our decision in spite of the real limits all of us may have. We do the good we can do and we pray and we listen to one another and we try to do this collectively, not individualistically. And as he has said time and time again, we do what good we can, even if our shoes get soiled by the mud of the street. Saint, uh, Pope Francis, from the very beginning of his papacy, kept emphasizing that the church needs to be a field hospital, kept emphasizing that we need to move to the margins, that we cannot be a church simply internally directed. We need a church which allows us to work with the poor, to, as he said time and time again, take on the smell of the sheep. We have the gospel in one hand and are living with and for others on the other. And we always do the best we can. So we've got respect for the other. We have the notion of missionary discernment. And what this ought to lead to uh, is to see in the gospel the healing of Jesus Christ. Again, in his first epistolic uh, exhortation on uh, the uh, joy of the gospel, he says that it is in this missionary discernment we find true healing. He goes on, we find true healing since the way to relate to others which truly heals instead of debilitating is a mystical fraternity, a contemplative fraternity. A fraternity of love 
capable of seeing the grandeur of our neighbor, of finding God in every human being, of tolerating the nuisances of life in common by clinging to the love of God, of opening our heart to divine love and seeking the happiness of others just as their Heavenly Father does. And so if we take a look at these first two value commitments, we see that they're not totally separate, that they're very much complementary. As we respect the other, we're also brought into the complexity of the real life that people live. And as we understand people in their real life, in their limits, in their possibilities, in their sin, in their grace, in the very muddiness, messiness of life, we are called to be missionaries and walk with people, helping, helping them to discern where God is calling them and in the process realize where God is also calling us. So we have respect, we have an acknowledgement of complexity, that things are not always neatly black and white. And as we bring those two together, I think we understand a bit more that um, we're being led by the Holy Spirit in this entire process. What might that look like? Again, a consistent ethic of life. What fascinates me is if you read those lectures of the Cardinal, one after the other, towards the end of those lectures, Cardinal Bernadine knows that he is dying. He is stage four pancreatic cancer. He knows nothing more can be done. And yet he continues very active until roughly a month before he dies. So 1995, 1996, there's a change in much of his language and the language becomes much more spiritual. And it's this interesting lecture that he gave in Melbourne, Australia, towards the end of 1995, that he basically surrenders himself to the Holy Spirit and acknowledges that the Holy Spirit needs to be our motivation in the Christian life. He basically called for a spirit-filled living church. And again, in that, that lecture, he says, the consistent ethic of life requires us to broaden our ways of thinking, our attitude, and our pastoral response. Again, very much like Pope Francis will say two, cent uh, two uh, centuries, mm, two decades later. The church is a chosen people, a mysterious communion, the body of Christ. When we understand the church in this way, we will be able to see the full beauty and relevance of our heritage as it is developed under the influence of the Holy Spirit from the apostolic age to the present. It will help us to become more tolerant of one another. And so looking back, he sees the action of the Holy Spirit in all that has been going on in the church. And he has trust and faith in the Holy Spirit continuing to guide the church into a future which is unknown. In calling for that spirit-filled living church, he basically, again, he's begun thinking about common ground at this point. He's begun trying to push the church out of a lot of the, the arguments between liberals, conservatives, between the North and the South, between all of those arguments, sadly, we tend to have. And he asked us as church to move beyond petty criticisms, jealousy, cynicism, soundbite theology, 
inaccurate and unhistorical assertions and flippant dismissals. Again, I think that would be a wonderful recipe for the church today. He called for humility, asking for the realization that there is room for diversity among us. We're not saying that every opinion is correct, but we're saying how the three elements come together, respect for the other, acknowledgement of complexity, belief that the Holy Spirit is guiding the church, allows us to move forward in hope, not somehow terrify as to what anything might happen that somehow challenges ways that we want to see the church as my church rather than as our church. Again, Pope Francis, very similar. This missionary discernment that Pope Francis talked about is really, he believes, the work of the Holy Spirit. It is acknowledged, he acknowledges that in responding to the Holy Spirit, the church may be called to change. And he's even stronger than, than, than Cardinal Bernadine was, suggests that in her ongoing discernment, the church can also come to realize that certain customs not directly connected to the heart of the gospel, even some that have deep historical roots, even some that we really like, are no longer properly understood or appreciated. Some of these customs may be beautiful, he said, but they no longer communicate the gospel to this day and age. He said we shouldn't be afraid to examine them. And in fact, he says, we shouldn't even be afraid to discard them if they are no longer leading us to Christ. He quotes Thomas Aquinas, as a good Franciscan. I wish he would have quoted St. Bonaventure, but he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas and points out that Thomas said that the, pre that the precepts that Christ gave us are very few. Most of the teachings of the church are expansions of that, important if they lead us to Christ, important if they lead us to a deeper living of the gospel. If somehow they move us away from that, maybe they are no longer needed or at least no longer needed to be understood in the way we do now. What can make sense in one age of the church, they keep people from Christ at another time. He says we always need to review and even change our minds in light of the authentic gospel teaching. And so those are the three elements. In a lot of ways, they're the variations of a theme of one element. Respect, understanding, complexity, lead us back to the understanding that the Holy Spirit is alive in the church. And it is Pope Francis who time and time again tells us that God is a God of surprises. And God is going to lead us forth, oftentimes in ways, individually and as church, we never expected to go. So what are the reactions to this? Obviously, the reactions both to Cardinal Bernadine and to uh, Pope Francis have been an entire spectrum. Some very negative, some very positive. To give one example of the negative, which has been coming up more and more recently, the former uh, nuncio to the United States, Archbishop Carlo Maria Viganò, has begun actually calling for the Pope to resign, feeling that he is leading the church in the exact wrong way. Um, within the past month, he has suggested that somehow Pope Francis is part of the deep state, uh, that that's what Francis is saying is wrong, and that 
the children of light should not be taken in by what he calls the children of darkness. Almost an apocalyptic understanding, but very strongly against the project of Pope Francis. On the other side of that is somebody like the Bishop of San Diego, Bishop McElroy, who has suggested in Albuquerque two years ago and several times since, that the pastoral of theology of Pope Francis is rooted in the life situations that women and men actually experience in the world today. That what Pope Francis is doing is reading the signs of the time and integrating the results of that investigation into the very core of the church's mission. If you read somebody like Archbishop Vigano, the Pope is destroying the church. If you read somebody like Bishop McElroy, the Pope is truly a son of the Second Vatican Council and perhaps the very first real result of the Second Vatican Council 50 years now after the close. That is the extent and, and the wide gap of reactions both to Pope Francis, similarly reactions 20 years ago to the work of Cardinal Burnaby. What about a school like FST? What I'd like to suggest is that a school like a Franciscan School of Theology needs to deal with those three elements. Maybe not exactly the same way as Cardinal Bernardine or Pope Francis, maybe exactly in the same way. But those three elements need to be part of FST because those aspects are also part of our Franciscan project. If we take a look at respect, um, the picture there is Francis with the Sultan, which we celebrated as Franciscans the 800th anniversary of last year. It is Francis of Assisi who acknowledged that all people, all people are sister and brother. Not only are all people sister and brother to us, all creation is sister and brother to us. He had an integral ecology 800 years ago. And that we see ourselves not over and above others, not over and above other elements of creation, but we are part of creation. We need to respect ourselves, respect one another, respect the creation God has given us. Similarly, as we look at complexity, it is Blessed John Duns Scotus, a major Franciscan scholar of the Middle Ages, who talked about the via popritudinis, the way of beauty, the task, task of bringing forth beauty in the world. And Blessed John Duns Scotus basically said, and Franciscan School of Morality has always said, that morality is never seen as the realm of unyielding moral absolutes, nor simply personal preferences. Franciscan morality from the Middle Ages on has been a middle way. It is an integration of what is best of a loving response to God in the real situations we find ourselves in. That's complexity. That's an acknowledgement of complexity in the 20th, 20th century, 21st century. Is an knowledge of complexity in the Middle Ages. And finally, the workings of the Holy Spirit is part and parcel of what the Franciscan project is all about. St. Francis called the Holy Spirit the true head of the Franciscan order. And that Holy Spirit, Francis said, is the spirit of love. And if you take a look at Franciscan spirituality, if you take a look at Franciscan theology, it is always the question not of good and bad in itself, but what is the best way we can respond to God's love 
here and now. It is constantly a movement to a deeper understanding of God's love for us and a deeper response of our loving God and one another in return. So if we take a look at those three commitments, they're part of the consistent ethic of life, they're part of Pope Francis's integral ecology, they're part of the Franciscan project from its beginnings. So in conclusion, I don't know if there's much more to say. In his address to the Synod on the Family a few years ago, Pope Francis challenged the people at that Synod to speak boldly, but to listen humbly. To me, that sentence adequately describes what the consistent ethic of life is about, commitment-wise, adequately describes what Pope Francis's project is, commitment-wise, and also describes the 800-year history of Franciscan theology and morality. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Father Nairn, for your lecture, which uncovers the beauty of the vibrant Franciscan tradition.